The church that you see pictured on here is actually the ruins of the church in Laodicea itself. So as we are here going through Revelation verse by verse, we're now taking a look, peering into the church of Laodicea. And as we get ready to share God's Word and continue on our way through the journey through Revelation, take your Bible with me and stand with me if you would please. And let's declare this together. This is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I am open and ready to receive from God's living Word. You may be seated and open up to Revelation chapter 3. i got to tell you about this guy named Phil. Well, Phil decides he's, he's going to go into the boss's office and he's asking for a raise. He tells his boss, sir, I, I just have to be honest with you. He said, I know the economy's in kind of a rough spot right now and there's a lot of competition out there, but he says, respectfully, I need to ask you for a raise. And then after um, he explains, what you need to understand, sir, you need to understand, there are three companies after me right now. Three companies. The boss is thinking to himself, I can't let one of my competitors hire this guy away. I don't know which companies are trying to, which of my competitors is trying to get him. But the boss gives in and gives him a 20% raise. And the boss says, before you leave though, he says, I'd like to know uh, which are the three companies that were after you? Well, he says the electric company, the phone company, and the power, <laughs> the gas company. <laughs> Some of you can relate to that. <laughs> Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse number 14. And to the earth, the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent." Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wow. This is a powerful passage of Scripture. And just so we understand where we are once again, because it's so important to see where we are on the map in respect to a couple of other places. We are going through the seven churches of the book of Revelation. We went from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamos to Thyatira and Sardis in Philadelphia, and we are here in Laodicea. The thing that you need to know about Laodicea is right next to Laodicea is Aeropolis. And right next to Heropolis is Colossae. So we have two other churches, Heropolis and Colossae, very close to Laodicea. And it affects everything that we're talking about today in the two verses that we're going to cover. In this church to Laodicea, Jesus in these first three verses presents two issues for us. Two very important issues, essential issues. The first issue is who Jesus is to you. That makes all the difference in the world, not just in this world, but in the world to come, doesn't it? Who is Jesus to you? And the second issue that's here is who you are to other people. 
Let's look at this together as we chat for that in a little review. Three titles were given. Jesus said, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Three titles. That first title, the word, the amen. It's actually a Hebrew reference, a Hebrew statement taking an adverb, changing it into a noun, and referencing specifically Isaiah chapter 65, verse 16, where Yahweh God says, I am the Amen. And when Jesus says here, I am the Amen, he is claiming to be Yahweh God. Now when you look at this in your English Bible, it was not the word Amen, because Amen is a Hebrew word. When this is translated in your Bibles, you see it there in Isaiah 65, 16, thus says the truth. Because that's what amen means. It's verity, it's truth. And it is understood that when he says, I am the amen, he says, I am the truth. And faithfully the truth. Always, consistently, forever, the truth. And Jesus is saying, I am the truth and faithfulness. Then entitled to it was the faithful and true witness. He switches it around, doesn't he? But he reiterates it again. Why is he turning it inside out? Because this culture turns everything inside out. Not just our culture, but the culture of the Laodiceans. Oh, there were many truths, they would say. But Jesus says, no, I am the truth. And in John 14, 6, Jesus made it very clear. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. It's not there are many ways to get to heaven. There is only one way. There is only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus. He's the only way. That's why missions is so important. That's why I encourage us all to participate and give towards missions every month. The third title that he gave was the beginning of the creation of God. This word beginning it's the same thing that we see in John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, the Word was with God, and God was the Word. The beginning is the origin. It's the authorship. And Jesus is saying, when he says, I'm the beginning, he's saying, I'm the author. I'm the creator himself. I am the author, and because he is the author of the creation of God, he has authority. So he has the authority to say what is true and what is not true. And we understand that who he is to us makes all the difference in the world. He is the creator of you. He is the sacrifice in place of you. He is the resurrection provision for you. He is the reconciler between you. He is the head over you and the stable foundation under you. That's who he is. But we also see here what's so very important is who you are to other people who he is to you, who you are to others. So who, who are you to others? Well, that's where verses 15 and 16 come in. Sometimes people don't realize the, the purpose, the, the flow of what's taking place here. So it's important to understand he's talking now about who you are to others. He says, I know your works. Your works are the things that you do around others, towards others, and with others. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Did you catch it? Three times he says, cold or hot. There seems to be something really important about this cold or hot thing. We'll see that in just a little bit. These two verses, though, are reflecting Jesus' concern for your influence on the culture 
and not having the culture control your life and be the influence of you. It's never a question of is there influence. There is always influence. The only question is who's influencing who? Are you being sucked into the culture or are you rising above the culture and demonstrating who Jesus, the one with the authority, is? Now these two verses are amongst the most misinterpreted verses in the Bible. Happens a lot. How can they be the mo amongst the most misinterpreted? Because people take them out of their literary context, out of their historical context, and they put them in our Western context. And by doing that, we kind of miss out. Just sort of like if we took something out of our American context, I eat, sleep, and drink football. <laughs> and you put that into context in another country, you eat a football? You eat a foot, you, you sleep a football? Do you become one and then sleep? You, how can you drink a solid object like a football? And you understand that figure of speech doesn't really apply to some other cultures, does it? The problem is when we lift verses out and interpret them by what we understand and we know and what we see around us, we can end up misunderstanding. You see, the commonly mistaken interpretation is being hot means you're spiritually on fire for God. And lukewarm means you're just compromised, you're just mediocre in your relationship with God. And to be cold is essentially an untouched pagan. Now, even our song that we sing, Light the Fire Again, we reflect that in there because that is a very American perspective. We want to be hot on fire for God. We don't want to be cold like a pagan. But here's the thing. We can sing that and we can have that reflected from our mindset in our culture and that makes sense to us, but that's not what it meant to the people in the church of Laodicea. Now think about this for just a moment. It says, I would, I would wish that you were hot or cold. Does that mean that God would prefer you to be a cold pagan rather than a lukewarm believer? God's preference is for you to be a cold. That doesn't make any sense that God would want you to be a cold pagan, does it? No. Now, when we make these adjectives into spiritual statuses, that's normal for our culture. That's part of our Western thinking, and that's okay. However, that's entirely foreign to the literature of the ancient world. They did not have that mindset. And since this view, though, is so widely disseminated, because we're Western thinkers, and you will see this view shared over and over again, it's not going to go away anytime soon. <laughs> there are going to be a lot of people through the years that are going to, you're going to hear people reflect that. Well, you know, hot or cold, God wants you to either be hot on fire for Jesus or be a cold pagan. No. <laughs> you're still going to hear it, even though it lacks the historical, literary, and cultural context. What's important is you don't interpret a verse by what is normal to our culture. You interpret by what it meant to the people it was written to, and then you apply that meaning to your life. Does that make sense? So then, so what did it mean to the people of Laodicea? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Because the proper interpretation of this is actually found in the conditions of the water present in Laodicea. The water conditions. What were the water conditions? Although Laodicea was located near two different rivers, because it was so wealthy, they had built extreme fortress type surrounding the city with one incredible, stupid weakness. They had no 
internal fresh water supply. None. In all the archaeology that has gone on there in the last 200 years, they have found zero wells inside of Laodicea. And pretty much that's what they expected because they had no internal water supply. They had one of the most incredible technologically advanced water systems piping water into Laodicea that the ancient world knew. According to UNESCO, which is the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, you've heard of UNESCO World Heritage Sites? Well, Laodicea is one of them. And they have done extensive research there and found that there are actually pipes and they have excavated, archaeologically excavated, these pipings that go into Laodicea from the Salvacos Mountain Valleys, six miles south of the city. This is incredible. They piped in water from six miles away. Now the piping was actually, and you can see pictures of this online, it is a double row of a mixture of tavertine, which is like a, a, a marble that was used in Roman area, and clay pipes, six miles of double pipes. And the, the thing about this is as that water was coming from those springs in the Salbacos Mountains, portions of the pipe were out in the sun, portions of the pipe were underground. By the time the water got to there, the water was, first of all, very lukewarm. But not just lukewarm, by the time it reached Laodicea, it was so heavily concentrated with minerals that it was absolutely horrible to drink. You drank it, <coughs> you'd want to vomit it out. It was that bad. In fact, it was such a problem that there were so many minerals in those piping, the Roman engineers designed a cap system where they would have cleanouts all along the way to clean out the minerals, to go in and be able to scoop out the mineral deposits just to keep the water flowing and to reduce how horrible it tasted. So Laodicea, when we now say, okay, so how does that affect the interpretation? Well, Laodicea was close to the two cities I mentioned, close to Heropolis, close to Colossae. Now, the city of Heropolis was well known for its refreshing hot springs. Remember, this is a volcanic area, and the hot springs brought in hot water that was just incredible to go bathe in, it saunas in. People would go there because it was considered medicinal. Now, you go a few miles away to Colossae, and Colossae is known for its refreshing artesian cold springs. Are you catching something here? This is the context in which Jesus is speaking to them. And Jesus says he's not wishing them to be like cold pagans. Jesus wished they could be refreshing like the cold water of Colossae or the refreshing hot springs of Heropolis. Starting to make a little more sense why he would say, I wish you were hot or cold, because it comes down to the issue of refreshing. And what he's saying here in verses 15 and 16, calling you to be different from the culture. Don't be like everybody else. I want you to be refreshing. I want you, I wish that you were hot or cold. I wish you would be refreshing and different. Can you understand this? You also understand hot and cold are considered refreshing. Lukewarm is not. It is considered you're just like the surrounding air. And if it's just like the surrounding air, you're being just like the culture around you. And the culture has sucked you in, made you like the culture, rather than you being Jesus to the culture. Now, Another example of this in, in historical context, in cultural context, when they would have banquets, hot and cold water 
was mixed with wine in the craters. I better explain this to you. Wine was used just like we use chlorine today. Here in the city, Sturgeon Bay, you bring some tap water. We've got good tap water here, but you will, you'll smell some chlorine, won't you? Why? Because chlorine kills all kinds of bacteria, viruses, protozoa. It, it kills parasites, anything that might possibly be there. And wine did the same thing. Wine, alcohol, is a natural carcinogen, cancer-causing destructive agent. It kills. And they would mix alcohol into their water in order to kill the bacteria, the protozoa, the parasites, the, the vi They had no, understand, they had no antibiotics. They had no antiretrovirals. They had nothing with which to kill parasites. They didn't have those things that they could take. And so a simple case of dysentery, you die. Because there's no IV to rehydrate a person who's lost everything. Still today, there will be not thousands or hundreds of thousands. The World Health Organization estimates this year there will be over seven million people, most of whom are children, who will die because of poor water. That shouldn't be in this world today, should it? But that's the way it is. Millions still die of poor water. So they would take wine, mix it in what's called a crater. A crater was a big bowl like this. And they would take three parts of water to one part of wine. Or four parts of water to one part of wine. As much as up to 12 parts water to one part wine. It was not something you could get drunk on. The purpose was not even just to flavor it. The purpose was to keep you from dying. That's a very nice thing, isn't it? But to make it refreshing, they would take cold, cold water out of the springs and mix it in the crater and put the wine in. And then it's on a hot day, boy, that's refreshing. And then on a cool day for a celebration, they would take hot water and mix the wine in with it. And this was the idea. This is part of the, the whole cultural and historical context that's here. Now Jesus said, if you're, if you're going to be lukewarm like that water that you get piped into Laodicea, if you're just going to be like the rest of the culture, I want to vomit you out of my mouth. Now, the word vomit is emise. You probably, some of our nurses know what that means. We have emesis bags to throw up in. Emesis is a medical term for vomit, and that's the Greek word here. And that is a natural thing when you taste bad water. You just oh, want to throw it up. So Jesus is saying, I don't want you to be lukewarm. Either a hot drink on a cold day or a cold drink on a hot day, that's acceptable, that's refreshing. Lukewarm is neither, it disgusts. Our works, the way you live out your life at work, at school, at, at the social settings you're in, in the marketplace, wherever you are, the way you live out your life needs to represent Jesus. And it needs to be hot or cold. It needs to be refreshing. So should you be hot or cold? Which one? The answer is yes. Yes. Hot or cold means you're refreshing according to the needs of the people that are around you at the time. Do you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul said, I will be all things to all men that by all means I might win some. To the Jews, I will be like a Jew so that I can win some Jews. To those that are under the law, I will live like those under the law, although I am not under the law. But I want to win those who are under the law so that they can know Christ. 
and I'm under the law of Christ, and I'm going to live in such a way that I can bring them into relationship with Christ. To the weak, I become like I'm weak, so that by all means, I might win some. This is how we are called to live in such a way that we are the influence to the culture, not sucked into the culture. That our lives are refreshing to people. Let me, let me give some ideas of how you can do that. The biggest way of refreshing is going to be dependent upon the love language of the person that you are interacting with. Love language. Some people, they know they're loved by works that you do. Acts of service, we call it. You do something nice for someone, man, they, they just feel like you have valued them. And to be refreshing, you can do something nice for someone, an act of service, and that may relate to that person. Be there for them at a difficult time. That would be another love language of quality time. Somebody who just needs you at a moment, just make yourself available and say, I'll, I'll be there, I'll sit with you, I'll wait with you, I'll, I'll, I'll show you my presence. And to that person, that may communicate the most amount of love that they can comprehend. To another person, it's words. And words never ever underestimate words. The scripture tells us that in the power of your words there's the power of life and death. You've seen me live among you now for 41 years. It was the 30th of June, I think it was, or something like that, that 41 years ago y'all voted and said, yeah, we'll take that one. <laughs> So in these 41 years, something that you may have noticed is I'm very, very careful. I don't tease people because I would be concerned that I could wound your spirit. And you, people might laugh along and think, yeah, just laugh, but I won't do it. I, I, I won't because I'm afraid that if I hurt your spirit, I'm going to wound you as a person. And I could, I could miss sharing the gospel and God's love with you. I don't put people down, even in mocking, just joking around. I don't do that. I will never put you down. I won't do that. I want you to feel safe here. I want you to feel safe with me. I want you to feel that I am going to only speak words that will build you up. That is my goal. I want to build you up. And in this world, think about how this world is. Sarcastic, cynical, and critical, and not afraid to say the harshest, meanest, vicious things that they can say. I won't do that. To be refreshing means that the words that we speak need to speak life, not death. And I would encourage you to speak life to those that are around you. Be careful with your words. Be present with people. Do things that make them feel valued and esteemed and loved. And speak words that bring life to them. Like a, like a cold cup of water. So the proverb says, are kind words spoken at the right moment. Let's speak the right words. Yeah. Who Jesus is to you strongly affects who you are to others. If you really believe that Jesus is the author, that means he has the authority and that he's the one who has the right to say what's right and what's wrong. And if you really believe that, you are going to stick to this is what is right or wrong, not what the culture says. I don't judge the Bible by the culture. I judge the culture by the Bible. I stand with what the Scripture stands with. 
Who Jesus is to you strongly affects who you are to others because if I believe that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven, then to others I want to be someone who shows them the way to Jesus because he's the only way. Does that make sense? Do you see who Jesus is to you affects who you are to others? So in closing, you need to make Jesus everything that Jesus wants to be to you. The ultimate truth the author with the authority. And then you be the refreshing that sets you apart from this culture and draws the culture to Jesus. So Jesus says, I want you to be hot or cold. Not like a pagan, but like a refreshing, giving, loving, caring believer of his. Stand with me as we close in prayer. So did you learn something today? Yeah, is Revelation becoming like, this isn't so bad. It ain't so hard. When we keep it in the context, wow, we've, we can learn so many beautiful things. Next week, oh wow. You think this was good? Wow. <laughs> We're going to have a wonderful time together. But first, we have a commitment to make. First to him, that he will be our truth and our authority. Second, that we will be the refreshing to our culture. That we will be to others what they need to bring them to him. You want that? I want that. We're going to pray together. Bow your heads for a moment, if you would, please. Close your eyes. And in this moment, if you say, Pastor, I need to surrender fresh and new to Jesus. I need to make sure that he is the amen, the truth in my life, the, that he is the authority in my life. You slip your hand up and you say, yeah, I need that. I need that surrender. That's awesome. And then others of you say today, you know what, Pastor, I really need to be a greater refreshing to the people around me and my family and my friends and my co-workers and fellow students. I need to be the refreshing around me to bring others in this culture to know the Jesus I love. Slip your hand up. Say, I need to be a better refresher. Yeah. Let's all pray together. Right out loud, just pray with me and say, Dear Jesus, you are the authority. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the King of Kings who died in my place, who paid for my sins, who went to the cross and rose from the dead. I surrender to you. I acknowledge my failings. I am a sinner saved only by your grace. And your grace is good. And it's powerful. It's transformational. And I invite you, Lord Jesus, transform me. Change me. Change who I am to be everything you want me to be. Bring the gifts out of my life and pour your refreshing into me and through me. And I pray, Lord Jesus, through my life, this week, people will be refreshed. That I will stand out from this culture ministering to this culture as your vessel. Fill me up and help me flow into the lives of others with your incredible love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, my dear ones. I love you so much. I wish you God's incredible blessings. You are dismissed. And watch those roundabouts. <laughs>